scientists, we wanted to pitch this at, at, at mainstream scientists, people that wouldn't ordinarily necessarily be inclined to research psychedelics. We'd like to kind of um, entice them into the, into the domain because we think it's our interest. So that, that's basically the idea. Um, okay, so, so now I'll, I'll introduce David. You know, he doesn't require any introduction. But I said to him, you know, how should I introduce you? Should I just say, you know, uh, should I just say you're amazing? And he said, oh no, no, today's all about the science. So, so less, less is more. So with that uh, um, sentiment, I think I'll introduce David to you. And, uh, Thanks, everyone. Good. Well, it's, um, thank you, Robin, for organising this. It's, uh, it's great to see so many uh, old friends of the audience, actually. Um, I'd like the enemies to stand up now so we can be clear where we are. You never know. You never know. Almost certainly afterwards, there will be something. Uh, so the question I want to talk about is why we should study psychedelic drugs. And um, the subheading was actually the subheading of the, um, the paper that hopefully you've all read this morning. It came out at 5 o'clock this morning. I hope you, you've all seen it. I tweeted it to you at uh, 10 to 6 this morning. So, and it's by this paper in Nature, Neuro, Nature Reviews Neuroscience, which I wanted to subtitle from presumptive prejudice to a neuroscientific enlightenment, but uh, one or two of the referees thought that was a little bit critical of neuroscientists, so we took it out, but it's back here for today, because I'm sure you're more sympathetic as some of the referees, but at least the paper got published, and I'll talk about that. But I'm going to start in the beginning. I'm, I'm going to start with this quote from William James, who, uh, in honor of our American visitors, was obviously the father of American uh, psychology, the brother of Henry James, a man who suffered from depression and who made some interesting observations about the nature of depression, which we can touch on later. But these were his observations on consciousness. Our normal waking consciousness is but one special type of consciousness. Whilst all about it parted from it by the flimsiest of screens, there lie potential forms of consciousness entirely different. No account of the universe in its totality can be final that leaves these disregarded. How to regard them is the question, for they are so discontinuous with ordinary consciousness. Now that was uh, as an in, a, a, a very profound and uh, meaningful observation. It obviously stood the test of time. And in his day, it was difficult to study them because uh, essentially psychology was about introspection. And the reason we have got into this field, and hopefully uh, others as well, is because it seems to us that modern neuroscientific techniques, particularly neuroimaging techniques, allow us an opportunity to address this question, uh, maybe not in its entirety, but at least to begin to address it. So, as some of you, probably all of you know, the, the, the real origins of the psychedelic uh, revolution uh, was the discovery by Albert Hoffman in uh, 1943 of of LSD. It was interesting, he was trying to make a better treatment for migraine and discovered that the Virgoc derivative that he was working with produced very profound alterations in his consciousness. He wrote about these and I think uh, when I was about 15 I read about them and I thought, that is amazing. If a drug can change your sense of time perception so much that a cycle ride that normally takes half an hour seems to take seven hours. There's got to be something in it in relation to understanding the brain. And that was one of the reasons I got interested in brain science in the first place. Because uh, clearly you could address questions about brain function using drugs. And, uh, and I, as a psychopharmacologist, I spent the rest of my life doing that. But only relatively recently I've moved into the area of psychedelics, largely because of uh, the pestering of Robin here, who wanted to do it. Um, but of course, we all were in fascinated by, and uh, I think, uh, infused and challenged by the writings of Aldous Huxley. Um, and Aldous is a particularly interesting person from my perspective, because I was taught by his stepbrother, Andrew Huxley, who got the Nobel Prize in Medicine and Physiology for um, developing the mathematical equations for the action potential. So I was brought up in 
Cambridge physiology with a very uh, molecular, physiological, physical approach to physiology, which is what I studied before I did medicine. Uh, but the other side of the family, equally talented and um, uh, insightful, was obviously Aldous, who wrote several books about his experiences with mescaline and other psychedelics. Uh, but also made this quote, uh, which uh, is, all gods are homemade, and it is we who pull their strings, and so give them the power to pull ours. And if, if Nature Reviews would allow me to put some more quotes into my paper, I'm going to put this one in as well, because this actually is about the drug laws. We make them, and then they end up controlling us. And so a little aside for today and the future is this, this area of research can only really flourish if we change the laws which restrict it. But that's a separate um, campaign of mine. Another quote from Aldous uh, in his book, uh, Doors of Perception. And this is a quote from William Blake. William Blake was one of the great uh, writers and um, artists of, of, of the, the, the England has ever produced. And I remember seeing his work in the Fitzwilliam Museum at Cambridge when I was uh, an undergraduate. Uh, I didn't realize quite how smart Blake was at the time. Um, but reading this quote of his, tells us an enormous amount about the insights that we should be making into brain function. If the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is, infinite. For man has closed himself up till he sees all things through narrow chinks of his cavern. And that is a wonderful quote. And all I would say to you is this, is that when you are looking out of the chinks of your cavern and seeing maybe a bit of bright light over North London. Think of depressed patients, because when depressed patients look out through the chinks of their cavern, they don't even see Wembley or the Hamilton Hospital. What they see are the fires of hell. And this will come back in the discussion about how we can use these drugs to improve the well-being in people with depression, because one aspect of psychedelic research is to allow us to understand the different ways in which uh, the brains become constrained to see particular kinds of uh, worlds out uh, with them. The other point I want to remind some of you of is that LSD had, has a profound effect on science. Now, these are the two most important Nobel Prizes in the history of medicine. Obviously, the discovery of the double helix and the decoding of the double helix with the polymerase chain reaction. Both of the insights into both of these discoveries were obtained under L using LSD when LSD was legal. And the reason we know that our burgers have got horse meat in them is because Harry Mullis's vision of recycling, infinitely recycling uh, small chunks of DNA using a polymerase reaction was achieved when he was having an LSD trip. Interestingly, driving on the road for a while. <laughs> <laughs> and the quick insight came from trying to decode a series of X-ray diffraction patterns, which was which were completely outwith anything that had been seen before. And the, and, and and it was proving very problematic. Because it is problematic, because no one had ever even conceived that you could have uh, a macromolecular structure of a, a living product which was as a helix, let alone a double helix. So those insights, which as I say, I believe are the most important ones ever in the history of medicine, physiology, life sciences. Uh, you might argue the most important ever, uh, unless you were a nuclear physicist. Um, were gained under LSD. And I often reflect uh, in my mischievous moments whether since 1964 when the drug was banned, science has actually missed a trick or two. And, and I think the Higgs boson wouldn't have been so difficult to find, maybe. Or <laughs> I don't know, it's just a thought. Not an easy hypothesis to test. But. And if we think about why this might be, I'm very taken by this quote of Einstein. 
No problem can be solved from the same level of consciousness that created it. And as I will argue over the next few minutes, you can't understand the brain simply by counting the number of neurons and uh, seeing how they interact. You can get some way towards it, but we need to start somehow get beyond that. But we also need to think about how the different elements of consciousness can be produced. And we, that needs, again, a higher level of inquiry. So before LSD was banned in 1964, there were about a thousand clinical papers, about 40,000 patients were in studies, there were 40 books, six international conferences. And this uh, <coughs> publication by Masters and Houston found that the results were overwhelmingly positive and, and they described it as a safe and effective treatment. Here's an example. This is actually uh, a recent example of a reanalysis of the, um, the LSD trials in um, alcoholism. And I don't know, are, uh, is Terry or here? Uh, and they basically applied modern meta-analytical techniques to the trials and they showed the effect size of LSD and alcoholism to be the region of what we, I haven't got my glasses on, so I can't see. Is that about one? So, certainly the same scale as any other known proven licensed treatment. Uh, and you might well argue, well, I would certainly argue, that efficacy in alcoholism might also suggest efficacy in other addictions. And that's an area that really does need exploring. Why was LSD banned? Well, it was banned largely because the CIA were worried that the American youth were preferring to see a different kind of world under the influence of LSD rather than go and kill Vietnamese. And what they did was they worked with the Drug Enforcement Agency to create uh, a series of horror stories about the effects of LSD. And it was banned. But even it was banned remarkably in the face of opposition from the person who would have been president if he hadn't been killed, Bobby Kennedy. And this tells you, this quote tells you precisely the problem we have, in that we have been locked into a mode of working which, with drugs like LSD, which has been driven by an anti-scientific view, and which very few of us have had the courage or the energy to challenge. So Kennedy said, why, if these clinical LSD projects were worthwhile six months ago, why aren't they worthwhile now? We keep going round and around. If I could get a flat answer about that, I'd be happy. Is there a misunderstanding about my question? So he knew, as everyone did, and I think all of us do, that there was the banning of these drugs was not had nothing to do with harms, it had nothing to do with a lot of interest. It was simply a political gesture. And nothing has changed, sadly, in the last uh, 50 years. And so one of the uh, outputs of this meeting, uh, which will be a petition amongst scientists, hopefully around the world, but certainly in the UK, to get the UK and the US and hopefully other countries' drug laws changed, and ideally, I would like to change the UN conventions, and there's an opportunity to do that at the Special Assembly in 2016. And I'm going to argue that whatever the drug laws have done to users, and they almost certainly made things worse, they have had a really deleterious effect on science. And I think it's hard to come up with a more severe example of scientific censorship. In fact, I have to go back 300 years to find one. And in 1616, the Catholic Church banned all books advocating the Copernican system of explaining planetary motion because they wanted to believe their interpretation of the Bible, which said that the sun went around the earth. So Copernicus was right. Galileo proved it was right by showing that the room, the, the the moons of Saturn rotated around Saturn in contradiction to the scriptures. He was threatened with death. Uh, Bruno was burnt at the stake for preaching Copernicanism. Galileo recanted and was put under house arrest. Uh, what was interesting, actually, they didn't actually ban the telescope, they couldn't really, but what they did was they banned all the books of 
related to Copernicus. So they, got, they tried to stop people accessing evidence. And I would say that the drug laws uh, have essentially done the same thing for psychedelics, as well as other drugs like cannabis and MDMA. Now that's quite a challenging statement, and if anyone thinks I'm wrong, will you tell me after this? So since, since the drugs were banned, there's been almost no research. There's been, uh, in the UK, there's never been an LSD study. There's, been, there's our side of cyber studies we're talking about. There's been a couple of MDMA studies. And there's been, I think, one LSD study two So you can read about that in the paper today. There are some pioneers of this work that aren't here. I just want to share with you some of their discoveries. Roland Griffiths started back in the mid-hundreds, uh, Nortis, uh, looking at psilocybin in volunteers and showing that a significant number, the majority experienced beneficial effects, which they described as being within the top five most meaningful experiences of their lives. And they had a similar proportion with an improved sense of not well-being and life satisfaction. Grobe is going to talk today. Charlie will talk about his work on end-stage cancer and other cancers. And this study by Marino and colleagues using psilocybin to treat OCD showed short-term and some persistent improvements. And this was a very interesting study for several reasons. It's, it was never followed up because they couldn't afford the drug. <laughs> because the scheduling of drugs like psilocybin, in our experience, increases the cost of research tenfold. <coughs> so they couldn't do more than these six patients. But what's interesting is how that has leaked out onto the internet, and now you will find lots of sites talking about using magic mushrooms to treat OCD. And then I want to get on to our work. So this has been done in collaboration with the Beckley Foundation, Amanda is here. And there are three reasons we've done this work. The first is to understand what psychedelics do. And I'm going to go back to the quote of William James. No account, but oh, this is a paraphrase, because he said the universe, and I'm just saying the brain. No account of the brain in its totality can be final, that leaves these disregarded. So the psychedelic state is an absolutely crucial question for neuroscience. And it, it has to be understood, because you can't explain the brain without explaining the psychedelics. And I would argue it's a gateway, like William James said, to understand the process. We also need to study these drugs because they're the only drugs which turn on these 5 ht 2 a receptors. And these are fascinating receptors, as I'll show you. Highly evolved and highly expressed in the most important brain regions. And of course, in the end, as a doctor, I want to use my knowledge of the brain to help me develop new treatments. And here's another quote from Stan Groff who said, and I fully agree with him, psychedelics used responsibly and with proper caution would be for psychiatry what the microscope is for biology and medicine, or the telescope is for astronomy. And that is why banning the research with these drugs is effectively the same as banning them. So of course the key then question is then how do they work? Now what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take you through some of the pharmacology and I'm going to show you some of my slides, but also some of Paco Bartigas' slides. So I'm kind of condensing his talk into mine um, so that you get a better understanding of the pharmacology. So here are the structures of some of these drugs. And they have, um, um, some of them are, are ergot structures on the left, some of them are phenylethylamine structures on the right. Um, the, the key thing is that they're all 5-HT2A agonists. Now, there are 14 different serotonin receptors in the brain, but the 2A receptor is very, very highly expressed in the most evolutionary recent brain regions. And the, that's where those drugs act. We know that from binding studies. The effects of psychedelics is determined, <coughs> completely predicted, the dose effect completely predicted by their affinity at the 2A receptor. Very high affinity drugs like LSD, you use in sub-microgram quality, low quantities, and uh, low affinity drugs like mescaline, you have to use very low quantities. They're interesting in a different way because not every drug which binds to the 2A receptor is psychedelic. Drugs like lithium are not. 
And what it turns out is that there are two ways in which this receptor can signal. And I'm not going to bore you with it, it's complicated, I don't fully understand it, but essentially there are two pathways. You stimulate the receptor, and one pathway produces changes in protein kinase C, and the other produces changes in substances like beta arrestins. And psychedelics produce a particular impact on one pathway. As I said, these receptors are highly localized in parts of the brain that um, are most re evolutionary recent, like the cortex, and they're particularly, as I'll show you from PET scans, uh, this is human cortex in the connector hubs. But they're also distributed throughout the body. None, you see, in the cerebellum. And you can also see the distribution of them on these pyramidal cells here. This is an image from the uh, group from uh, Simbi in Copenhagen. We have a few of them here today. Uh, part of this image from them. This is a tracer that they have made using uh, a psychedelic drug called Simbi 36. Maybe I shouldn't have said it's a psychedelic, because it'll probably get banned now. <laughs> this, uh, that's deadly serious, deadly serious, which could impede their research. But anyway, this is a drug, this is an agonist. This is a drug that works at the 5-HC2A receptor like psychedelics to st stimulate them if you took more of it, but the tracer doses they're using do not produce any change in consciousness, but they do bind to the receptor, but they only bind to the agonist state of the receptor, the functional state. And you can see the highest density of the functional 2A receptors on the posterior and anterior single These receptors are on two sorts of neurons. This is, these are studies done by uh, other groups on ours, but I'm essentially using, other, using several labels, it's possible to show that these receptors are on glutamate neurons, the pyramidal cells, and on interneurons, GABA cells, which contain the precursor enzyme for GABA, glutamic acid decarboxylase. So there are two separate sets of cells in the cortex in express these receptors. And that is really important. If the general principle in brain function is if you stimulate a neuron or get a neuron to fire, you must also, in parallel, stimulate inhibitory neurons because otherwise excitation will become too pronounced and that will lead to the seizure. So all systems of the brain have this balance and we therefore presume that, well, there is some evidence I'll show you in a minute, 5-HT2A stimulation activates pyramidal cells and activates inhibitory interneurons in parallel in order to uh, allow a, a functional activity of the pyramidal cells that is not excessive. This is a very <coughs> elegant example of why, where knockout technology in a mouse can <coughs> illustrate exactly where receptors are. So what you see here in the bottom, these are the 2A receptors on the layer 5 pyramidal cells, and these mice don't have them. They, the gene has been deleted, and there's no receptors. Here's the physiology of these receptors. What you see here is the stimulation of the 2A receptors using this agonist, DOI. DOI activates the receptors, it makes the pyramidal cells fire faster, and then you can reverse it to some extent with antagonists. And you can see when they're recording from these cells, this is from Artigas' own group, recording from cells here in the medial prefrontal cortex, you see there's a massive increase in firing of most of cells. There's some cells inhibit, some cells have no effect. But overall, the ones that increase, increase firing a great deal. They've also done some work looking at how it changes EEG measures. And there will be a talk later on today about this in rats also. Uh, and this is relevant to the talks you're going to hear about the MEG studies. But you can see here a very clear effect of this 2A agonist to change the frequency distribution in the brain. You now the drug's given and there's a rapid alteration in low frequency cortical oscillations. And you can see if you pre-treat with a pure blocker, a 5-HT2A blocker, MDL, there's no effect. So this drug completely prevents access of the agonist 
to the receptor and therefore stops the physiological changes. And these are these, this effect is shown here. Profound reduction oscillations and uh, blockade by the antagonist. And this is just a blown up version. This, these are some of the uh, EEG measures and here's that data. And of course one of the really interesting questions is why are these receptors there? Why would you want a load of receptors that give you strange changes in consciousness? And some people have said, well, they're actually irrelevant. It seems a bit strange, but anyway, you... Uh, but some people say they don't do anything. They're only there for people who go away and eat strange mushrooms or <laughs> cacti. They're kind of protected there. You know, if you do that, then you won't you'll get you'll get ill and therefore you won't do it again. But it, finding evidence that serotonin itself is not easy. We don't have good tools to change serotonin function profoundly in humans. And in fact, the problem with serotonin is the peripheral effects of serotonin stimulation can be so profound it can be quite dangerous. But in, in rats, it's, you can overcome this by squirting serotonin into the brain. Here's the, the frontal cortex of the brain. And what, the, what this what Actigas' group has done is and I want to freeze serotonin in here. And here you go, serotonin squirted in, and here you see the increase in firing of those cells. So under certain circumstances, serotonin does stimulate those receptors. And that is one of the great questions. What are those circumstances in humans? And of course, one of the, the target uh, possibilities are conditions like psychosis. Maybe psychosis is a condition where you have Overstimulation of these receptors by endogenous serotonin, you know, perhaps accompanied by or in a state of extreme stress, and that's a very credible theory and it's a testable theory, um, and it's one that we are hoping in time to test ourselves. Now, obviously, the brain doesn't exist as a single set of independent entities. There's massive connectivity between within the cortex and between different brain regions. Here's a simple diagram of how uh, the, this part of the cortex, the orbitomedial frontal cortex, here you see uh, illustrated here, uh, how it, where, it, where these different elements, the different parts of these regions of this cortex project. And, and one of the major outputs of the medial prefrontal cortex are to the monoamine cell groups, the cell groups in the brain stem which produce uh, and release dopamine, serotonin, and noradrenaline throughout uh, higher brain structures. And you can see here that if you stimulate pyramidal cells in the prefrontal cortex here, you get through, presumably think, a long glutamatergic neuron Fire, uh, connecting to the VTA, you get an increased activity of the dopamine cells here. You can see the dopamine cells fire more as a result of stimulating the medial prefrontal cortex, and you can block that with the antagonist MBO. So increased dopamine function could be re related to the sense of well-being and the improvement in mood that is reported after people do something. And a few words about ayahuasca, that's South America for those of you. Uh, that's a, a native South American using ayahuasca. Ayahuasca is a complex plant, a combination of plant products, which, whereby DMT, which is a 5 ht 2 agonist, and 5 methyl DMT, are allowed to get into the brain by taking another substance, which is present in the other plant, which blocks monoamine oxidase in the gut and the liver. Otherwise it wouldn't work, but if you block peripheral monoamine oxidase, you can then get the active component of DMT uh, and, and fight DMT into the brain. And here are some drawings that some of you who've taken psychedelics will recognize as being probably similar to the ones you've used. Which is not surprising because DMT is a and here you can see that this combination, they've used 5 methoxy DMT and chlorgeline, a monoamine oxidase inhibitor. And they have, here you can see that they have 
found this profound stimulation of the pyramidal cells, the same way as giving LSD or DO. And they also went on to study the effects of this in the rat brain using an MRI technology. And, and, and they did this after the studies, the first study we reported that Robin was talking about. They saw our reports and they said, that cannot be right. Now how could a drug turn off brain function when it turns on the neurons? And then they went ahead and they showed, yes, it does turn off brain function. And We've got to explain that now, and that's not so easy, but it's probably related to the complexity of the interaction between the inhibitory neurons which are turned on by DMT and the excitatory neurons that are turned on. And our, our belief is it probably that there is a net effect to switch off those parts of the brain rather than to switch them on. But that is, that, we may learn more about that in the course of today. And they also showed you could block this effect with antipsychotic drugs, many antipsychotic <coughs> drugs block the 2A receptor. So this is the finding that uh, really made us most interested and excited by this field. We'd expected, I think, like most of you, uh, that if we gave psilocybin and looked at brain activation, we would see an increase, probably in the visual cortex where the pretty pictures are. Uh, we didn't. All we saw were decreases. So the decreases weren't in the sensory areas, they were in the connector hubs. And I have a sort of rule of thumb in science, I've been in it for a long time now, that if you get exactly the opposite of what you're predicting, it, it's likely to be true. Because there is no bias. You're not cajoling or stats to get the right answer. You're finding something that absolutely blows your head away. And a few times in my scientific life I've seen things as completely paradoxical as this, like the discovery of inverse agonists, which we did back in the 70s. And you know it must be right, and you have to then to go away and reframe your whole uh, interpretation of pharmacology to make sense of it. And we're still working on that now. We were sure it was right because the magnitude of the subjective effects was predicted by the change in the blood flow, and we also were impressed by the fact that the changes were largely in these regions, these connector hub regions. You'll hear more about those today. What was fascinating was when we tried to get this published, referees said, well, these are just changes in blood flow. And I thought, well, that's obvious because that's what fMRI is. But anyway. <laughs> As if that would be a reason for discounting. Yeah, anyway. But anyway, we went on, we thought, well, it is just patient in the blood flow, let's see if we can show it isn't. So we went and did, did, did the next study for the group in Carnet, who are hopefully here. You wave, Carnet, wave. Yeah, that had Suresh at the back, yes, thanks. And, the, and it's been a really very fruitful collaboration, <coughs> because actually, I should have pointed out, they were also collaborators on the fMRI studies. But this is their special expertise that very few other people can do. And MEG just measures electrical changes in the brain, independent of blood flow. And we showed that in the same regions as there were changes in blood flow, there were marked perturbations, decreases in the power of the different spectra of the MEG. So that proves it's an effect on neurons. It also confirms it's very regional. In fact, using working with Carl Friston, who I saw this one, just wandered in. Wave your hand, Carl. Um, and his group. Is Rosalind here? Oh, okay. So they won't let her out now. Um, we were able to use this technique of dynamic causal modeling to show, in fact, if you model the changes in MEG, you can show that the major effect of psilocybin on the MEG signal is driven by an impact here on the day of five practices. And we thought, that is amazing. The first time I think in humans, someone has been able to show a specific effect of a, a particular neural subclass on a human brain experience. Now, that's what I'm saying to you. If I'm wrong, I want you to tell me. But that, I don't think that's ever been shown before for you. 
This is what the referee said. Nature and Nature Neuroscience said, oh, this is too specialized for our readers. This is not relevant to nature. Neuron were even more amazing. They said, this is not in our areas of interest. Now, having published a few years ago that paper I showed you on the molecular mechanisms of 5-HC receptors, they published that. At this point, you know, you, become, you begin to think, you know, the world is mad. But in fact, it's this, the world is not mad. The world is just so prejudiced against psychedelic research that they won't even think about it. It particularly when you're doing it to you. Now, this is what science said. Is Peter here? No, okay. We had an interesting discussion with science, and this is what they said. A cynic would say that if you're messing around with a major neurotransmitter system where the receptors are strategically located on an important set of neurons which play a crucial role in the interaction between brain regions, what do you expect? <laughs> yeah, quite. <right. laughs> that's what we expected and that's what we found. And again, this is quite bizarre. And Carl and I had, a, had an amazing dialogue, which would actually probably should be in the public domain at some point, about how, how utterly moronic these kind of statements are. You have shown for the first time that you can stimulate a cell, two cells, either the pyramidal cell or the fast fighting interneuron, in the cerebral cortex of humans. And you can produce a change of consciousness, which is as profound as what we can do. That's got to be of interest. And in fact, it's a, it, it kind of denies the whole value of pharmacology. Well, you change any receptor in the brain, you know, you're going to get the same thing. But of course, you don't. These are very localized. And in fact, so here's some data to show that, just to prove that that referee was wrong. You do get very different effects if you do different things in the brain with different receptors. So these are MEG images produced by Shures. This is tear gabbing. This is a study we've done with him. Tear gabbing increases GABA in the brain. Increases inhibition in the brain, but everywhere in the brain. This is propofol, which also increases inhibition in the brain, but at a postsynaptic level rather than tear gabbing increases GABA in the synapse. Propofol <coughs> increases the stimulation of GABA A receptors. These are inhibitory, global inhibitory effects, and this is, this is psilocybin. Now the effects are, you don't need to do statistics to show that these are fundamentally different effects. These are really interesting differences. And I do find it bizarre, and I just think that there is prejudice against this research at every level, not just in government, <laughs> not just in lawmakers, but also I think many neuroscientists are prejudiced because they just don't even, I've never thought about this possibility. And again, that was just a resting state. If you look at your vote uh, changes in MEG, when you do stimulus-driven changes, you can see that there is almost no impact of psilocybin, and there are major impacts of the GABA drug. So just to answer to that referee, these in the audience, uh, you can make specific changes in key regions of the brain and get very meaningful and localized changes. It's not just a massive artifact. And in fact, the way I'm conceptualizing this now is a bit like this. Um, and hopefully, you know, some of the people talking today will maybe uh, help me know if I'm right or not. So I think there are two, two dimensions in which we can think about cortical function, at least in relation to humans. Uh, one axis is the arousal axis, which is driven by glutamate, increasing arousal, GABA, inhibiting arousal. Uh, that axis determines whether you remember something, it determines how much you remember of it, it determines actually whether you're eventually you're alive or dead because you stop breathing. So, and it, so this is the axis which determines cognitive level. Uh, declarative memory requires glutamatergic stimulation to lay down memories and attenuation of GABA to allow that. And amnesia you get when you take a lot of GABA drugs like alcohol. And the other axis has got something to do with valence, emotion, meaning, or whatever, and that's due to two-way stimulation. So that's, I don't know if that's helpful to any of you, but to me it, it, it does, it helps me think a little bit about the kind of ways we should be trying to interrogate uh, the role of, of drugs in brain activity. And of course there are therapeutic possibilities. Uh, we'll talk more about these later, depression, well-being, alcoholism. Uh, uh, 
the discovery of new antipsychotics. This is an interesting model in the human now, as it is in the rat, for testing it. I want to finish by talking about cluster headaches. Because they're not particularly, they may be neuroscience, they may not. No one knows where they come from. Some people think they're vascular, some people think they're from the hypothalamus. They're a severe in disorder of people in middle age. There are many thousands of people afflicted in the UK. And women who get them say, they're the most painful experience of my life, worse than childbirth. Many sufferers commit suicide. If they can't get treatment, and treatment's not very effective, they just, it's so bad, they kill themselves. Many now report or resort to using mushrooms, so as I do. We approached the UK support group for cluster headaches, and they said, well, we couldn't possibly support research using an illegal drug. <coughs> you say, well, hang on. You know, people, people give opiates for pain relief. They're illegal. <laughs> you can't have a sensible dialogue. And one of the one other real wonderful paradoxes is this. There is a derivative of LSD, 2 zoma LSD, which is not psychedelic, but hasn't really ever been properly tested because it's still contaminated with the LSD. <coughs> and uh, we are planning to do that. We are planning now. We're not sure, actually, whether that, this drug actually is legal or illegal in this country. What we do know, is anyone from the Home Office here? <laughs> <laughs> what we fear is if we ask them, they'll say it's illegal. Uh, because that's their default position. So what we're planning to do is do the study without asking them to see, see if they are them. I'm going to finish with another quote from Huxley, who obviously is the, the person who's put psychedelics most into the public domain. And this is the one quote that they did allow me to put in the nature reviews. Uh, it was challenging, but eventually they said, yes, okay, we'll break all our rules. We can have a quote. Great is truth, but still greater, from a practical point of view, is silence about truth. Facts do not cease to exist because they are ignored. By simply not mentioning certain subjects, totalitarian propagandists have influenced opinion much more effectively than they could have by the most eloquent denunciations. And that is exactly what the drug laws have done to this research. They've effectively stopped people even thinking there are questions to be asked. And now we need the neuroscientific enlightenment just as we needed the telescopic enlightenment when they locked up Galileo. There's the paper. Hopefully you'll all read it. And, uh, and if I'm wrong, let me know. Thanks very much. Cheers. Chris Walton, I'm a psychologist in private practice here in London, uh, a deep interest in altered states of consciousness through many mediums. I just, quick question, I just, uh, on one of your earlier slides, it said high dose psilocybin in one of the studies. I just wonder what you class, what they classed as high dose. So they were using it orally, and it was 20 milligrams, was it? Hmm? 30 milligrams orally, yeah, that was the, 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 the British study. So let me just explain another thing. We, all our studies are done with intravenous psilocybin. And that's because we can't afford to use oral psilocybin. Because it's 10 times more expensive because you've got 10 times a dose that we use two milligrams. Question here? Um, Who's that up there? Hello, I'm Matthew Riding. I'm a student, a sixth form student from outside of Mark Oh, um, Are you allowed out of school? Um, <laughs> you know, today. I didn't encourage you if you're breaking the rules. I was just wondering if there had been any research into the use of nootropics such as paracetam to potentiate the positive effects of psychedelics. Mm, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know of anything. Does anyone? You've got an expert group here. Does anyone know the answer? A anecdotal evidence. Anecdotal evidence, it might. It does. They might, it does, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a question here, and then there's a question here. Okay, so I'm Jamie Ward from the University of Sussex, and I work in synesthesia. And I, I did actually predict that you would have reduced visual activation, or at least not necessarily an increase. Yeah. So when people have synesthetic experience, you don't always get an increase in the visual cortex, you get in a lot of association areas. But also there's research from the sixes that show that people on psychophysical tests have impaired visual thresholds for detecting 
things like colour. So even though colours are subjectively enhanced, they, they report not being able to discriminate colours in the same way. People have like colours opposite from sound and flicker and things like that. So I would have expected to reduce visual activation, but only from vision. I would expect increased visual activation from other sources of input. Yeah, and that, that's very really helpful. And obviously, uh, Jack Howell will talk about hallucinations later on. But the reason we predicted increased activation was from the rather small, but at least it did exist, work on, del on delirium, where visual, visual experience of delirium were supposedly associated with increased activity in the visual cortex. So that was our that was where we came Question about that. Um, uh, hi, David. Ben Sessa, a psychiatrist from Bristol and uh, Planet UK MDMA study. Um, if we're going to tackle the drug laws, we need to tackle it from all angles. You are doing a fantastic job of uh, tackling it from a neuroscience perspective. What do you think needs to be done from a socio-cultural perspective? What other groups need? What do, what other other groups need to do to really reverse these laws? Well, I think what we need to do is we need to get all the professional bodies that are interested in uh, using drugs, and I'm not just talking about psychedelics. Actually, I think the greater the opportunities in terms of therapy that have been denied are from cannabis. You know, there are about 60 active ingredients of the cannabis plant. <coughs> Almost none of them are studied because people assume they're illegal, and if you ask the Home Office, they say they're illegal even though they're not. You know, I mean, so, so there's a broad range of problems uh, there, and, and a broad range of drugs which are impeded. So, yeah, professionals have got to do, have got to campaign, right? And hopefully the public also, you know, get on the blog sites, Ideally, write to your MP demanding some change in the law. Because in the end, okay, whether neuroscience has been held back or not is kind of irrelevant to most people, but the fact that therapy, therapeutic advances have been denied is most people do care about. Next one. Put your hands up with the microphone so I don't Yeah, good. Hi, um, shall I start? Yeah. Uh, my name's Will, um, I'm a PhD student at UCL. Um, and you talk Are you allowed in here? <laughs> <laughs> local joke, local joke. Um, and uh, you talk about how um, psychedelics can open up this alternative consciousness and um, that might be beneficial for um, different psychiatric disorders. Yes. Um, and I was wondering if uh, you think that that kind of opening up of alternative consciousness provides the same benefit for all psychiatric disorders or whether there are kind of differential benefits for, you know, you're talking about addiction, possibly OCD, depression. Yeah. So I was wondering if you could talk about how it might yeah. Be beneficial for those seven things, which are obviously very. That's difficult. a really interesting. I don't. I think that's a great question for today. It's a question that I think we're going to have. We'll park. We're going to hear more about. With, with, that's a question to take up at the end. I think. Right? But it, uh, the simple answer would be, I guess, where you've got overactivity, over over connectivity in the default mode, then that would be the most obvious areas to target. But let's let's bring that back in the end of the day. Yes, yes. Right. My name's Robert Taylor. I'm a campaigns director with an interest in free speech. And you mentioned something about um, some presentation that you were going to make in 2016. Could you just... 2016 is the UN General Assembly special session where they talk about the drug laws. It's the one chance in my lifetime to do something about it. So what I would like is... I'd like particularly, where are the Dutch people here? I would like the Dutch government to lead a campaign to change the UN conventions, and I will work with you to do that because there's one chance to do that, and I think the Dutch will be able to lead it. Next question, who's got the microphone? Yeah, here. Hello, uh, my name is Richard. I'm uh, an MSc student at uh, the IOP. Um, I have a question about the selection pressures yeah. that led to the evolution of 5 h 2 a Yeah. Um, there's one theory from Terence McKenna who talks about how. Yeah. The doses of psilocybin um, have affected our ancestors in the savannah and increased their visual acuity and their promiscuous nature. Do you think speculate? Yeah, I, I think the whole, I think it's absolutely fascinating why these receptors have evolved to have such high density in the human body. I mean, I think they're, it, it, I presume they have some adaptive value. I don't think they're just there to cause psychosis. I, I, I mean, whether, whether they've been selected for because of the long-standing use of psychedelics by early cultures is an interesting one because you may think that's very far-fetched, but it may not be because we know that with alcohol, there's been selection pressure in, uh, in, in ethnic Chinese to have a particular, you know, there's been selection of a metabolic enzyme that actually delays the clearance of alcohol and the idea of 
And that's occurred only over about 200 generations, so it's quite possible, it's conceivable, it's selected. It's, yeah, I mean, hard to test, but it's possible. Yeah. <laughs> Microphone, yeah, yeah. Hi there, my name is Charles. I'm actually a doctor working in psychiatry at the moment. Um, we saw in the Griffith study that there was a 40 month improvement after Solitics and Psilocybin. I'm just wondering how, uh, if you've got this drug which reduces connections between neurons yeah. and reduces blood flow, um, we might understand the and stuff. Okay, we'll flow. come back to that. That's going to be discussed by Robin and others later today. Next question. And up, yes, up there. Uh, my name is Maxim, I'm a male scientific, I just have general interest in those questions. Uh, just about the psychedelic experience in itself, um, do you have any evidence that uh, adrenochrome, for instance, uh, has an effect on uh, the same receptors as LSD or psilocybin uh, does? And what is the chance of that occurring naturally? Uh, yeah, the old adrenochrome hypothesis that there's some condensed metabolite of, uh, of adrenaline. Um, it's certainly not as potent. I don't know the literature. I'm looking at people, the old people who might even remember what adrenochrome was, John. <laughs> Does anyone? I don't. I, I, I don't know. I don't even know if it crosses the blood brain barrier, actually. It's an interesting question. It could be, maybe it's time to, to review it. That's one of the great Huxley theories, yeah. At the back there. Hi. Uh, my name is Toby. I'm an MSC student at Sussex. And um, I was just wondering what you think about uh, salvia research. It's always struck me as being under research yeah. and not very well understood, but it's also not illegal, so it seems yeah. like. Or as far as I know, it's so Yeah, no, it's very interesting. So we know that the pharmacology of salvia is quite different. Is that it's um, it's a kappa agonist of the <laughs> kappa receptors. In fact, we have been planning a study, haven't we, Amanda? When you get that contract with Imperial sign, we will do a salvia study. I'm not interested in salvia. Yeah, yeah, but we will anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really interesting question. Uh, well, yeah, I, I, I agree. It's what we should be studying. We should actually. It is. It's bizarre. We don't have brain fingerprints of all these drugs that people use, which make, you know, it's, it's a very difficult, it's very difficult, I was saying to a lady from Nature here this morning who was doing a podcast, very difficult to get grants to study things. You can get grants to test hypotheses, which may be completely irrelevant, but you can't get grants to study what drugs do in the brain, and I, I just think it's a bizarre, where's the MRC guy? Why did you turn that grand down on the finger? <laughs> <laughs> and I'll tell you why you turned it down. You said it's great, it's good science, but it's not addiction, and it's not neuroscience. Just finding out what things do in the brain isn't actually science. And that's one of the problems we have in British science. We're not interested, we're interested in, there's too much hypothesis testing and not enough hypothesis forming by more in, by general inquiry. <laughs> Yeah, the MRC are great, actually. They funded two of the psilocybin studies, yes. Hi, my name is Ryan. Thank you very much for the talk. I was wondering if you consider any preventative measure, like can they be used psychedelics or cannabis, uh, to prevent psychosis or infection or OCD in individuals or you know, groups of people who we consider it's a really interesting, we haven't thought about it much, but I was struck, I was in the Andes last year, and um, I was amazed by going to museums in the Atacama, uh, how the, 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 the natives, people there, were, were using psychedelics for like 5,000 years. We, we presume it had some adaptive value, I mean, so maybe, well, maybe there is a prophylactic value in low dose. I mean, there are Indians and natives in Brazil who apparently use ayahuasca and their children. Uh, I mean, I, who knows? Hard to study, but it's possible. Well, there's none that would convince you it couldn't be caused, it couldn't be related to the other aspects of the society, I don't think. No one would believe, it could be true, that's what I'm saying, I don't think anyone would believe you could say it was true. People would say it was possibly due to other factors. Oh, a neurologist here, the first neurologist asking you I'm Adam Zemmer, I'm a neurologist, thank you for a really wonderful talk. This is an ayahuasca question, because yeah. there's an interesting paper which shows that during the imagination levels the activity in visual cortex rise to those seen during perception. This is picked up on Jamie Ward's point, so I wondered whether you've looked at developed activity or activity during imagination in your, in your cohort. No, Robin will tell you what we're doing, and yeah, we can touch on that. But, yeah. The memories. I suppose the memory task, yeah, we'll come back to that. Let's take three more questions before I have to move on. So who's got the next microphone? Hey, Ned, uh, Luke Williams from Imperial and Burkbeck. Um, you mentioned uh, SIMB36, 
as the pet tracer, you yeah. know, saying that hopefully it won't be made illegal, but in fact it has just been subject to a temporary control order. Um, not, not in Denmark, I trust. No, but I wondered um, if you thought it was worth um, campaigning to the ACMD and the government in general to stop this temporary control order so it doesn't become fully I think secure. this is part of the general case. So the nature lady this morning, where is she? Podcast girl? Yeah, there she is, waving. Um, yeah, so there's another example of impediment of science now. So a, a fascinating tracer is going to be much more difficult to use because if we want it in this building, we're good at where you were this morning, we're going to have to now get a special license to hold it. So another example, which I didn't even see. Yeah, in the back there, the microphone. Uh, hi, I'm the from the train in Birmingham. My name's Francis. Um, I um, was just wondering, I certainly thought about the prejudice in science. Yeah. Um, I recently had a patient who tried to circumnavigate the drugs laws by purchasing some alpha-methyl tryptamine online and uh, came in and my take sadly died. Um, and I was struck mainly by the, um, the extreme prejudice and ignorance of many of my colleagues in how to manage it, but also about the substance and how it worked. And uh, I feel perhaps that the best way of tackling this might be really ground to educational level, certainly I don't know what a career was like, but Lester didn't spend a lot of, a lot of time educating us on how to manage and treat and about um, drugs that people might be taking. And I just wondered if you had any advice on how to perhaps um, be engaged in trying to open up uh, the medical field. And to yeah, so obviously, yeah, I mean, that's a really good point. You know, sign up to the ISCD website and you can at least share your experiences there. But you're right, there's a lamentable about the lack of education of uh, medics about anything like this at all. <laughs> it should change, absolutely. Yeah. Hopefully it will. There's a question in the back there. I was curious to know whether uh, anything in your study would enable you to study endogenous DMT, which, given that it's an endogenous chemical, then I can't see if you're only real problems with that as being a legal substance as it's, it's endogenous. Yeah. Was there anything that your study enabled you to do to be able to look at? Yeah, we are. I mean, it's a, really, it's a, a really interesting question. So, you know, are there endogenous psychedelics like DMT or glutathione? Hard to study. Now, one way, one of the reasons it's hard to study is, is that the antagonists which you need to study the 2A receptor, the MDL compound, are not available for human research. But we are working on that as well. So we are working, trying to get the key tool compounds that the rat doctors use all the time available for humans. So we could address those kind of questions. Yeah, absolutely. I'll take one more. Who's got the microphone? Wave it. Yeah, shout. Yeah. Hello. What do you think that psychedelics come up from the philosophical issues surrounding <coughs> consciousness? That where does it come from? How does it? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's a that's a question for people who know more than me about philosophy. <laughs> but I, I'm, I'm but I'm going to stick with a little bit I know about neuroscience. But I think that as but as I said at the beginning, I'm, and I'm with William James. And I'm with um, Blake. I think we need to know. We need to see the brain in, in its entirety, in, in, in its multiple different ways of functioning, in order to properly understand the brain. And that's what this conference is. The be hopefully the beginning of a much longer dialogue, which will work in that.